tuning into the Inner Revolution podcast. My prayer today is these words will speak to you where you live and create lasting change. Hey friends, Jason here with the Inner Revolution podcast. Just uh, again, great to be with you. And before I get into my devotional thought today, I want to just encourage you, I've been doing these little uh, three-minute clips, I call them the Inner Revolution snapshots, just just something new, just something a little shorter with a more concise thought. And uh, check them out on YouTube as well as our IR Facebook page. Uh, subscribe. Uh, that really helps. Actually, I'm trying to get to 100 uh, subscribers. Uh, that way I can uh, change the link of the page to make it more find, uh, discoverable. But uh, always love to hear your feedback. I uh, want to definitely be uh, sharing topics that are relevant. And uh, just again, thanks for all of the feedback I get on Facebook. But these are definitely important days, uh, days to have a message, uh, a truth that is greater than ourselves, greater than our preferences, greater than our feelings, and definitely not a day to walk by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, to walk uh, in the promises by faith uh, to really interpret our world. So today as we share the scripture, uh, I want to uh, just consider this thought about being awake and uh, when we talk about being awake or having our soul being awake, um, you know, we want to consider it as God opening up our, our, our hearts, our spirit to receive something from him that is supernatural. Sometimes what happens is, uh, you know, as a gardener, as flowers are uh, starting to bud and bloom, if we try to force the flower to open, it will die. Sometimes we get anxious and want to see the bloom come to come to its full maturity. But if we force it like a rose, if we touch it, what happens is the leaves will turn brown and actually the petals will probably in some cases uh, come off and the, the life of the flower will uh, will greatly be diminished. So there's that anticipation, there's this uh, beautiful time of watching it mature and, it, and it really experience its full beauty. Now, when you think about someone's uh, heart or spirit, especially when you think about a little child uh, as they're being parented, and it's so important, our words, it's so important, our actions, it's so important, our example, because uh, as a little child, they're so uh, innocent and so aware uh, to please. And also they are uh, really learning and they can pick up bad habits just by watching so quickly. But if we were to yell or scream or uh, really act with a wrong spirit, we can close their spirit. And what that means is it, we can shut it down. Uh, you know, I've seen situations where uh, people in authority have belittled people and it shuts down their spirit. It causes them to look at themselves in a wrong way. Maybe they believe the lie that they're somehow uh, inferior or a loser. Or in some cases I've heard uh, where teachers have said to students, you know, that, you know, you're not going to amount to anything and that you know, what's wrong with you? And they, there's this belittling that goes on. And what happens in someone's spirit when that happens is it shuts down compartments in their soul. And there's this decision made that, you know, they must be right. Something's wrong with me. You know, sometimes with people with disabilities, they feel like they're inferior or less than uh, someone that doesn't seem to have disabilities. Um, we all have weaknesses and we all have disabilities. Some are known and unknown. Some are obvious and some are not obvious. But how we handle the innocent is really important. Even in adults, just how, uh, for instance, when there's correction or when there's uh, discipline, open shame can really uh, cause someone to be hypersensitive and not want to, to be exposed again. They, uh, for instance, they maybe take a step of faith and it doesn't go right or it doesn't go according to plan and there's a reaction. 
Uh, and then, you know, there again, there's this um, vulnerability that that if not handled right, it can really wound and close someone's spirit. Now, that's not really my message today, but that's a real that's a real scenario that we're seeing all around us. People can be overreactive, uh, overthinking, be very, very angry, and they speak things. I mean, I've seen in our political climate that people are divisive and uh, devouring uh, friendships and devouring people with their words, and they're closing people's spirits. And people distance themselves uh, because hurt people hurt other people. And, and so this is why God is wants to open our spirit to him. He wants to nourish our spirit to him and to protect us from uh, words that close our spirit, actions that close our spirit. You know, it's amazing in counseling, you know, talking with people and even in my own world, thinking about how sometimes the past speaks to us, uh, things in our past, unresolved conflicts or unresolved areas in our life that really continue to uh, be like a, a piece of sharp glass. They cut us. And it's so important to let the past be in the past. I mean, we certainly learn from our mistakes, but on uh, in, in, a real, in a real way here today, uh, God has forgiven you and I, and we are clean in his presence today in Isaiah 118. And, uh, but if the past, you know, if it uh, addresses or impacts our present in a negative way, it can close our spirit. It can cause us to live in self-defeatism. It can cause us to be insecure or uh, be apprehensive. Um, and, and so therefore, we really want to just seek God to awaken our soul to him because uh, the devil is all about silencing people. He's all about distancing people. He's all about isolating people. He's all about dividing people. He wants to uh, definitely do that through disrupting the emotions. And this is what happens with closing of the spirit where, uh, again, like Peter, when he heard Jesus's words, he followed afar off. What was happening? He was interpreting what Jesus said based on his own understanding, and he distanced himself because he didn't agree with what Jesus was saying. But in John six sixty three through 66, there was a realization that he had the words of life, and those life words were going to transform his, uh, his heart. So again, closing our spirit, you know, again, the music we listen to, um, the people we hang around, the, the the things that we're a part of, our influences, do they open our spirit? Which means, do they create a new beginning? Do they build expectations? Do they uh, lift up Christ or lift up potential or lift up joy? Or are they something that causes us to be very small, to be very insecure, to be very defensive, to be very reactionary, to uh, to be very proud. I mean, we see a really arrogant spirit today, like it's my way or the highway. What is that? That's a defense mechanism that is from a closed spirit. You know, when you look at, you know, I'm sure we've done this, but <clears throat> you ever hit your hand or have a cut? And uh, I remember this with my son recently. Uh, he had a table fall on his hand and, um, you know, even looking at his hand, it would cause him pain. It was it was very unusual. He said, "Dad, don't even look at my hand. It, it just the just you looking at it causes it to be painful." And it made me think to myself, like when we are wounded, if we do not bring our wounds and our and our sores and our soul scars to God, it will create such a hypersensitivity to pain that will be consumed with what happened or what is happening. <clears throat> you know the tragic situation of abuse or the uh, wickedness of, of uh, physical abuse, not only sexual abuse, but physical abuse as well. Uh, just the mistreating of someone's, uh, not only their body, but their soul. And they grow up and there's a distortion, there's a apprehension, there's a fear. And um, God says, I want you to take those pains to me. 
I want you not trying to fix yourself, but let me help you forgive. Let me help you forgive yourself in some cases. Let me initiate healing in your life by not trying to reconstruct and make things right, but to cast that care on him and he replace it with something that's life-giving, something that opens our spirit, something that nourishes our soul. And uh, I know we're talking a lot about closing of the spirit here already, but uh, address those things in your life. What is it that makes you apprehensive, defensive, reactionary, angry? You know, James chapter 4, verse 1, it's something that's unresolved in our hearts, something that's not surrendered to God. You know, somebody asked me one time, where is the power of sin? Yes, we have a sin nature, but the power of sin is in any uncrucified area of my life. It's in any area that I've not surrendered to God. That will be the epicenter of where sin thrives, where the power of sin grows. So it isn't that I have to try to stop sinning. That's impossible. But we keep surrendering these areas in our life, these weaknesses, these thorns in the flesh, these areas that Satan is constantly trying to box us in, shut us down, silence us. Uh, he may say things like, oh, your, your words don't matter, or your impact is, is a waste of time, or uh, you're a big loser, or whatever lie that is the, the, the accuser in Revelations 12, 10 and 12, 12, that he accuses the brethren day and night. So again, we need to be awake to the things of God so that our soul uh, grows, our heart is open to God, and we are uh, maturing in Him. So uh, again, uh, we can characterize uh, awakening our soul in Psalm chapter 57, 8 through 11. I want to read a couple of these verses, but to looking at things as a new beginning. Like we wake up in the morning and we say, okay, yesterday's gone. Tomorrow I don't have it necessarily. It's a gift if I do. Today is a new beginning. What are you going to do today, Lord, in my marriage, in my friendships, in my relationships, at my job? Uh, what are you going to do in my personal life? What are you going to do uh, or how are you going to manifest yourself and mature us today? This is an awesome perspective. You know, I was talking with one couple and uh, just an incredible couple. And uh, the wife was saying, you know, every day I have to look at my husband with a clean slate, clean ledger. I have to look at him, not in his past. You know, and, and when we know when we look at people in our past, we're like, we have a ledger. We have like this expectation. When are you going to change? When are you going to do it differently? What, you know, why are you still doing the same thing over and over and over? But this, this lady said this, she goes, no, I'm going to forgive him. I'm going to deal with him in the now. I'm going to deal with him in the day with a clean slate. And you know what? It transformed their marriage because when we take the past and we sling it at each other in the future, uh, it closes the spirit. Now, granted, you know, we're not denying what's happening. We're not suppressing what's happening. We're not ignoring what's happening, but there's an approach where we go to God first and then we deal with things as a new beginning. I mean, imagine God deals with you and I in new mercies every day. There is Lamentations 3.23. There is new mercies every day. And that newness means never been used. They're, uh, they're, they're like brand new. It's like getting into a car and it's never been driven before. Um, it's that kind of mercies if we could, uh, you know, make it practical in that way. It's so much more than that. But um, mercy awakens my soul. Grace always creates a new beginning. This is why grace is such a powerful thing in a believer's life. Grace creates all the time new beginnings in my life. Uh, but we have this legalistic side of our hearts that want to, you know, we want justice, we want to correct people, we want things on our terms. Uh, and I don't know how long it's going to take as Christians and I say this to myself first to, to say that it's not going to happen our way. And to the measure that we get that into our thick heads is to the measure that we're going to have a new beginning. It's not going to happen necessarily our way. It may happen, but it's, I'm believing it's going to happen better. It's going to happen in a better way. Well, let me read this. <laughs> uh, 
Awake my soul, Psalm 57. Awake my soul. Awake the harp and lyre. I will awake to the dawn. I will praise you among the nations. I will sing of you among the people. You know, one translation says in Psalm 57, 8, it says, Awake up my glory. You know, all of us may have kids and uh, my, my kid is awesome and he loves to sleep. And when you wake him up, it's interesting, you know, you can shake them, you can yell at them. I wouldn't recommend that, but you can do it abruptly. And then the person is kind of like, you know, they, they don't know where they are necessarily. They're, 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 they're like wondering what's going on and it could be frightful. But the way God does it is he can do it that way, no doubt. He certainly can do it that way. But uh, there's a way to wake someone up gently to uh, maybe rub their head or back, speak softly to them. Um, again, there's a gentleness that God uh, can, can awaken our soul to remind us again, to point us back into a direction that, um, that we had forgotten. Maybe there's a promise that God has given you. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden, through life and complications and difficulties, we forget what God's promised. And then God reminds us. He said, remember I told you that? And then all of a sudden, we're awake to a new reality. We're awake to a new beginning. We have peace in our heart. You know, uh, and, uh, and sometimes God will not give you something new or give you direction necessarily until we're faithful to what he promised before or what he's asked us to do before. You know, how many times has people come to you and said, you know, I don't know the will of God in my life. You know, I don't know, um, I don't know what God's direction is in my life. And my question always is, is what has God given you to do already? Have you been obedient to what he said already? And uh, that causes a little bit of soul searching. And that's very healthy because God is saying, listen, uh, I am leading you in order. Well, to be awoken uh, in truth, to, to be awake, to have the eyes open and uh, have people, you know, you, you've talked to people like uh, lights on, nobody home kind of thing. You know, someone's present, but their mind is in another place. God is saying, I want you 100% where you are in the moment. I want you to enter that moment because I have something to show you in this moment. So the psalmist is saying, listen, awake my glory so I can praise you. I want to be in a place, Lord, where I can praise you. Now, uh, you know, we see this in Psalm 108, 2 through 5. Again, uh, a alertness, a readiness, a, an understanding, an awareness of, okay, God, what are you doing? See, fear closes the spirit. Anxiety closes the spirit. Uh, shame closes our spirit. It causes us to be uh, feeble Christians. In this sense, uh, it makes us very needy. Uh, okay, what? how can people meet my needs? And we've all met people that are chronically needy. And it's like, uh, it's all about them. It's all about their problem. It's all about what's going on in their life. And, and granted, there are times and seasons where we have uh, a lot of needs and there's nothing wrong with that. But all the time, all the time, uh, you know, and my response to my my problem is is really important because we don't want to be leeches we don't just want to leech and you know some people wonder like hey why am i alone and nobody really wants to be with me and the question is you know uh proverbs 17 17 and 18 7 you know as a friend he loves at all times and he's friendly he's got a ministry in his life he's got life to give but if it's all inward uh then people will distance themselves from from that kind of person so, uh, again, opening of our spirit. We, we want to be careful uh, not to think naturally uh, and enter into fear. Like fear is the emotion of self-consciousness. It's like me at the center, me at the driver's seat. And no wonder that so many people are in fear. You know, I've talked to people and they're like, what do I do now? You know, now that this, this, and this is happening. It's like, wait a minute. We need to be awake to the Spirit of God. We need to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Nothing's changed. Our mission still is the same. Our method may change, but nothing's changed. Our climate may make it a little bit more difficult, but our God is still the same. We want to be awake to the right things. 
You know, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 34, be awake to righteousness and you will not sin. That's interesting. Uh, awake to righteousness. It says this also in Matthew 7, uh, 33. It's, it's like, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know, sometimes we forget this. We seek not only what we want, we don't, we seek God, yes. We seek his face, yes. Uh, not just his hand, we seek his face, but we also seek his righteousness, like our right standing in him, who we are in the power and privilege of his son. A needy Christian uh, is very small. They're feeble-minded. They they can just be, it's all about them. They're negative, typically. They're all very self-centered, self-oriented, myoptic. They're, they're looking at things from a very shallow point of view. God is saying, I need to awake you to a new reality. I need to awake you uh, to things that are going on. That's why we love reading the book of Revelation, because what happens? It opens our heart to the reality that will soon come to pass. Now, uh, I love Psalm 1715, uh, another great chapter. Uh, uh, the psalmist is writing, I behold your face, and guess what? I am awakened to your likeness. You know, it's interesting. Yeah, when we behold sin, we, we uh, are awakened to our sin nature. When we behold the evils of the world, we are awakened to the depravity of man. Uh, but when we are awakened to see his face... We discover the beauty in Christ. We discover the, the, the transforming power of grace. We see the uh, undeniable work of mercy. We, we see the power of truth that prevails in every situation. Just because the result doesn't happen doesn't mean God is not always working. So beholding his face, you know, this is why it's such a unique time. Uh, one writer calls this season with the masks a faceless generation or a faceless society is maybe a better way of saying it. You know, the, the countenance of a person, the, um, you know, I believe it takes more muscles to frown than it does to smile. We have so many, uh, so many dynamics to the face. And when it's covered, we really, uh, we lose something. We lose not only the body language and the, uh, the look and countenance of a person, uh, you know, and this is why we will, we really have to be very careful in our communication these days because it's, you know, we just can't, like a text or an email, it, we lose the emotion of it. We, we really have to purpose in our heart to do that FaceTime. And, um, but in a faceless society, we have to really even more purpose to be aware, not only of that person's heart, but what is the spirit speaking in the words that I'm hearing. You know, somebody says, you know, read between the lines. It's like, okay, what's the Spirit saying in the words that I'm hearing? And like David said in Psalm 17 too, he says, I want my sentence to come from your presence. So if my sentence is coming from my present, from the presence of God, then it'll be life-giving words. There'll be words that open our spirit. And this is the whole point here in Psalm 17, 15, is we awake to your likeness. You know, people forget who they are and whose they are. And they are awakened to uh, maybe just broken things, broken lives and, and uh, wasted years. And God says, you know what? Uh, I've forgiven you. I have something greater for you. Let's make decisions by faith and look at yourself as an overcomer, as a winner, regardless of what you cannot change. Uh, I am present with you. And be awake to that new reality. Well, going back to... The child analogy, you know, when you discipline your child, and there's many ways to do it, by the way, um, but the ultimate goal of discipline is to break the will and not close the spirit. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, you want to discipline your child, uh, and God does the same with us, and each child is different, each person is different in what they respond to. Um, it's not just the infliction, uh, affliction of physical pain. Uh, it can be other means, but whatever that is, God's saying, I'm trying to redirect you. I'm trying to change your mind to realign it to my mind. And I want you to have an open spirit to me. Now, I am not saying have an open mind. I'm not trying to be a secularist here. Oh, you just need an open mind and you just swallow all the garbage that the cosmic lie 
produces. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a willingness and a humility to receive from God, to receive from truth, to receive God's heart behind and God's wisdom behind what's being said. Now, a child, again, they don't know better. So there's that innocence that we have to manage with great uh, care because kids are fragile. So if we're screaming and yelling or handling or pushing or that's why slapping uh, someone in the face is exceptionally disrespectful and even more traumatizing to a child. You never hit a kid in the face. Why? Because um, the face is the glory of the individual. Uh, and if you slap it, it's almost like saying, you know, get away from me. It's a rejection move. It's a, uh, and our words can be like a slap. So we want to, again, we want to be careful with our words in Ephesians 4, 29. We want that which, you know, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, only that which is used of the edifying in the grace of God to the hearer. Now, um, again, our words don't have to necessarily be flowery, but they can be in the spirit of grace. We can speak directly according to that person's capacity uh, with firmness, and it can be very edifying. But again, uh, that word, don't let any corrupt communication, that word corrupt in the Greek means don't let anything that would damage love come out of your mouth. So if I'm damaging love with my words and I'm closing someone's spirit and I'm treating them um, condescending to them or uh, I'm treating them like a child, uh, if I mean, what I mean by that is let's say an adult is speaking to another adult and they treat them like a child it's very uh, counterproductive. I mean, I hear this all the time, how parents um, talk to their grown-up kids as they were still adolescents. I mean, that is, um, that is, that is not good. That is uh, something that closes the spirit. Same thing in a marriage. When a, when a spouse talks to another spouse, um, a husband can be like a father to his wife and like a father-daughter relationship, not healthy not healthy. Uh, same with a mother-son relationship with a wife to husband, not healthy. Uh, what is it? It's a condescending. It's, um, it's uh, something that doesn't uh, open the spirit to passion, it doesn't open the spirit to creativity, it doesn't open the spirit to uh, new beginnings. So just as I close today, we want to care be careful not to belittle people but to look at them in their potential. Know nobody after the flesh. Uh, we see this in 2 Corinthians 5, 16. How is it that I can open up people's spirit? We don't look at them in the flesh. 1 Corinthians 2, 2. We don't look at them according to their past. We don't look at them according to their sin. We don't ignore it, but we handle them in the grace, mercy, and truth of God. And of course there's accountability. Of course there's ways to... Uh, help a person get the help that they need so they don't live in the rut, in the lie that they're used to living in. But how I treat them, how I handle them, how I look at them, how I process in my mind their value is is talking about awakening. This can only happen as we're awake to the reality of God. Because um, a man can despise his wife. A wife can despise her husband. Why? Because of unresolved conflicts. Because of things that... Uh, are not changing because of expectations not being met. Well, this is a, a great thought today. We want to be awake to life-giving things. We want to, uh, again, wake awake my soul to righteousness. You know, and maybe today in your family or in your world, maybe you're quarantined today, maybe you're isolated today. Uh, let's not just be awake to the problems going around us because that'll make us, uh, uh, that'll end, we'll, enter not only to anxiety and fear, but we'll actually get neurotic um, and we'll become a hostage in our situation. But let's be awake to the things of God, awake to the promises of God. Second Peter 1, 4, let's be awake. Let's have, our, let's have our spirit gently, or in some cases, abruptly shaken to get us out of our, out of our stupor and enter into the true reality. You know, there's so much truth out there uh, based on facts and knowledge, but is it the truth? Is it the absolute truth? Well, 
These are these are good questions, and so uh, be be awakened to these things today. Awaken the dawn, awaken my heart to the dawn, as we just read there in, in Psalm fifty seven. Like what happens at the dawn? It's a new beginning. Today is a new day, new promises, new mercy, new grace, new love, new forgiveness. Forgive yourself. By the way, that's a big point there. You know how can how on earth can I look for other people to forgive me when I haven't forgiven myself? You know, some you know people say, "Oh, that's the hardest thing to do." It, yeah, in one sense, it, you know, if we're wrestling with ourselves, I mean, our free will is God's greatest enemy in some cases. God struggles with our free will. He's saying, "Cast that care, cast that worry, cast that pain to me, and I'll give you new life. I'll give you a new beginning." Hebrews ten twenty. I will give you a new and living way. Uh, I will awaken you to a new, a new way of thinking. Ephesians chapter four. I will awaken you to a new way of uh, interpretation. James one twenty one. I will look. I will show you a new thing, and give you a new hope. I'll give you a new understanding. I'll give you a new language. A new language. Amazing. There's so much. So much uh, language today that drags people down. But I want to be awake to the things of God. I want my my posturing, my position. My, I want to point in the direction of the, of north, of towards heaven um, today. So uh, cast down those things that close you down, shut you down, that bring in rejection or defensiveness. Let it go. Just let it all go. We live for the audience of one. Uh, God is pleased with you today because he's pleased with his son. So enjoy and have your heart be awoken to eternal things. You know, last thought here. Somebody said, what is the call of God? And we always think of events. We always think of things to do. We want to change our world. And I'm all about that. But the, the first part of the call of God is to enjoy God. Enjoy God. Am I enjoying God where I'm at? Am I enjoying Him in the difficulty? Am I enjoying Him? I may not be enjoying the difficulty, but we can enjoy Him. And that's the first place to know what He's called you to. Well, friends, thanks so much for being a part of this cast today and hope this blessed you. God bless. Thanks, friends, for joining us for another episode of the Inner Revolution podcast. Please find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and subscribe so that you don't miss an episode.